everyone. Welcome folks who are here and those who are joining us from home to our Bad Mexicans author reading and Q&A. <laughs> 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 We're so fortunate today to have Kelly Lytle Hernandez here with us. Um, my name's Rocket. I work here at the Achucha, Centro Cultural and Bookstore. And um, if I could just take a minute of your time before we go ahead um, into this author reading, I just want to let you know a little bit about the Achuchas. So Tia Chucha Centro Cultural um, is a cultural center and bookstore that's been in the San Fernando Valley for about 20 years, going on 21 years this year, I believe. Um, and we love books, obviously. Um, we have a lot of programming that we like to do with the community. Um, so we will give like free classes, free arts classes to folks. So if any of y'all live in the San Fernando Valley and are interested in looking into some of the services we provide, please feel free to look us up. Um, we're on Instagram at Thea Chucha, and we're also online at www.theachucha.org. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, Kelly Lytle Hernandez holds the Thomas E. Lifka Endowed Chair in History and directs the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies at UCLA. Um, a 2019 MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. It's in quotation marks. I'm not saying you're not really a genius. <laughs> 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 but the, uh, she holds the 2019 MacArthur Genius Grant recipient and she is the author of the award-winning books Migra and City of Inmates. She lives in Los Angeles, California, and she's going to take it away for you now. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> Thank you. So good evening, everyone. It's really nice to see you all. Um, so I'm Kelly Lado Hernandez. I'm at UCLA, and I'm a historian. I work mostly on issues of race and immigration and mass incarceration, or what we call the carceral state. Um, and so I'm here to talk about my new book tonight. It's called Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire, and Revolution in the Borderlands. And it tells the story of this group of Mexican rebels or dissidents who came to the United States in the early 20th century to try to stoke the outbreak of the 1910 Mexican Revolution. And that group of revolutionaries was known as the Magonistas. They were more or less led by someone called Ricardo Flores Magón. So I just want to get a temperature check before we get started. So how many folks have heard about the Magonistas? OK, so a few, maybe a third of the room that we have here. Um, how, who's had a chance to read the book? I just read. You just read part of it. Okay, so we're starting at, at the beginning, which is fine, which is good. I just want to know where we're at. So what I'll, I think I'll do tonight is I will first give a brief overview of the book and the story of the Magonistas, and then I'm going to talk about why I think this story is really, really important for everyone in the United States to know. And then we'll go a little bit deeper into the book, and we can do this like a conversation, right? If you have a question that comes up, something you want to add, you don't have to wait to the very, very end. It's, we're a small group, so we can build our knowledge together. So you ready? Okay, so um, at the turn of the 20th century, there was a dictator who ruled Mexico between the years of 1876 and 1911. That dictator's name was Porfirio Diaz. Now, Porfirio Diaz was a legendary military general who took power and held it all in his office. There was a group, well, there are many groups of dissidents who um, emerged in Mexico to try to challenge the Diaz regime. And Diaz would always disparage them as malos mexicanos, or bad Mexicans. So that's where the title of this book comes from. The groups of people in Mexico who were challenging the dictator become disparaged as bad Mexicans. But they are known by historians as Magonistas because they followed someone named Ricardo Flores Magón. In Mexico, the Magonistas ran a newspaper called Regeneración. And on the pages of Regeneración, they challenged Porfirio Diaz. They outright called him a dictator. They called him a tyrant, um, a brute that he had invited foreign investors into Mexico to come and buy up all the land displace Mexicanos and turn them into uh, wage laborers, early racialized wage labor force. Porfirio Diaz did not like that at all. 
So he had these guys arrested multiple times. He had their printing presses in Mexico City completely stomped out and destroyed. And he even had a, a gag order issued against them. So that by 1903, Ricardo Flores Magón and the journalists who were working with him could not publish their, their articles anywhere in Mexico. And it looked as though if they spent much more time in Mexico, they were going to be assassinated one way or another, slowly in prison or jail or quickly, right? Um, perhaps shot in the back. So they flee Mexico and they come to the United States with the hope of rebuilding their social movement to oust Porfirio Diaz from power back in Mexico. Um, they are successful. They are able to relaunch Regeneración from the United States. They establish a political party called El Partido Liberal Mexicano, the PLM, and they're able to establish an army. And it's really an army of the dispossessed. All of those campesinos and folks who have been removed from land in Mexico were looking for work in the borderlands. Many of them joined this PLM army. And the PLM army raids Mexico from Texas in 1906. They raid the small town of Jimenez, Mexico. That raid of the PLM army from Texas to Jimenez stokes fear across the United States, not just in Mexico. The question for us is why is there so much fear in the United States? Well, Porfirio Diaz had invited Anglo-American investors down into Mexico to either make or to multiply their millions. And they came to own about 25% of the Mexican land base and to dominate key Mexican industries railroads, mining, and more was dominated by Anglo-Americans. Mm -hmm. And Porfirio Diaz promised to protect those investments. So when you had the PLM army raiding Mexico, threatening to take down Porfirio Diaz, this Jimenez raid looked as if, as if these magonistas in the borderlands were going to destabilize um, US investments in Mexico. So in 1906, the United States government begins to work very, very closely with the Diaz regime to stitch together what I call a cross-border counterinsurgency team to try to snuff out the Magonistas revolution before it could begin. The U.S. Department of War, the U.S. Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Justice, U.S. Marshals, U.S. Postal Service, sheriffs and cops across the country join with the Porfirio Diaz regime to try to hunt down Ricardo Flores Magón and the Malvinistas across the United States before they could turn this you know, one raid into an all-out revolution across Mexico. So this is you know, the, the story at the heart of bad Mexicans, is the social movement that the Malvinistas are attempting re to rebuild here in the United States, and the efforts of the United States and the Mexican governments together to crush their rebellion. Um, I'll tell you now that the Magonistas are successful. They're able to outrun and they're able to outsmart this cross-border counterinsurgency team. And they're able to create the conditions to incite the outbreak of the 1910 revolution. And they do that to a large degree from here in the United States. So that's their story in a nutshell. And it is riveting. I mean, forget about my writing, right, as a historian. Their story is cinematic, it's extraordinary, they're bold, they're brilliant, they're brave. They fight against some of those powerful people on earth. I mean, the investors in Mexico are the Guggenheims, the Rockefellers, the Dohinis. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. These are some of the most powerful people on earth. And this group of Mexican rebels are able to outsmart and outrun them and create the conditions for revolution. It's an extraordinary story. All while the United States government is trying to extradite them, deport them, arrest them, imprison them, do whatever they can to stop this revolution. Now, why is this really important for us to know here in the United States? The Magonistas are legends in Mexico. Schools are named after them, towns are named after them, streets, there's two streets in Mexico City named after Ricardo Flores Magón. This year, the Mexican government declared to be the year of Ricardo Flores Magón. There are celebrations throughout 2022 he died at Leavenworth Prison in 1922, 100 years ago. And so he's being celebrated in Mexico right now. Almost no one in the United States knows who Ricardo Flores Magón is, except for folks who come out of the Chicano movement, right? And we can talk about that in a moment. 
But what I'm really trying to do with this book is take this riveting, cinematic, extraordinary tale and smuggle in key moments in Mexican-American history for a general audience. Those key moments are one, that yes, the Magonistas are fighting against Porfirio Diaz, a dictator in, in Mexico, but Porfirio Diaz, his power grew under the wing of US empire, right? And so it's US, the rise of US imperialism that's really at the, the heart of the story. Diaz invites these investors in, um, the investors and the US government prop up his regime, all while making it possible for Anglo-Americans to, as I said, make or multiply their millions. So this book takes us right into the heart of US empire. And it takes us right actually into the birthplace. US imperialism begins in Diaz's Mexico. That once the transcontinental railroad is completed in 1876, US investors look up and go, what's next? And they look south and they see Porfirio Diaz saying, come, come down here. And those investors say, we're gonna do something different this time. Rather than lay claim to the land, right? And settle the land. We're going to dominate economically and politically without taking the reins of governance. And Porfirio Diaz is like, yo, I'll hold the governance for you, right? You come down here and bring your money. So US imperialism actually is born in Diaz's Mexico. And this book, this story really strikes at the heart of all of that. Um, as the US investors and other Europeans go into Mexico, they're dispossessing millions of indigenous communities and campesinos across Mexico so that US folks can get access to that land, build factories, build um, farms, do mining. About 90% of Mexico is dispossessed, is landless by the end of the, 98% by the end of the 19th century. Those be people become wage laborers in Mexico, but they also begin to migrate. And they migrate to a large degree. They take those railroads that US investors had built and they take them north into the United States in search of work. So the rise of US imperialism also creates the beginning of Mexican migration to the United States. So if you want to know anything about the early history, the beginning of Mexican migration to the United States, this book takes you right into the heart of that story. That's critically important because Mexican immigration is the largest immigration that this country has ever experienced. We often talk about the so-called nation of immigrants as about a European immigrant story. But by 1980, Mexico had become the primary sending site uh, of migrants to the United States from anywhere in the world. We are now experiencing a demographic revolution that within the next 10 to 20 years, we will be an increasingly brown nation, right? By a large degree that has been driven by Mexican immigration to the United States. That migration begins back during those day, early days of imperialism in Mexico under the reign of Rufio Diaz with expansion of US investors. So there's two stories, right? History of US imperialism and the history of immigration to the United States. You cannot know or understand without Mexico and Mexicans. But Mexico's immigrants who arrived here in the United States were not just some other group of immigrants. They ran headfirst into a web of white supremacy across the southwestern United States. Segregation at schools, segregation at work, segregation in neighborhoods, very high levels of racial violence. About 500 Mexicans and Mexican Americans were lynched in the United States between the 1870s and the 1920s. And nobody talks about it. That history, which many scholars describe as Juan Crow, something very similar to Jim Crow, really sets the conditions for Mexican incorporation into the United States and Mexican life to this moment. Yes? I have a question because um, you mentioned the history. Um, and I was wondering if you could find some kind of history where they put videos of like no Mexicans, no dogs, no black people. And, but there are barely any pictures shown of the history. Is there a reason, like, or why it's not, they're not shown in history? Because I just, I just, Ah, some documentary and, and they talk about it, but where are the pictures? Where 
If someone can tell me or take in this information. Yeah, so I'm just gonna repeat the question for folks at home. So the question was, um, if there were so many lynchings, why are there no photos of the lynchings, right? Or where's the photographic evidence? Perhaps it's being suppressed or what is going on? That's really interesting. No one has ever asked me that question before. It's original. So I thank you for that. And so I'm gonna talk off the top of my head as to what I, what I think is going on. Um, I think in some ways you ask that question because of the large number of photos we have of African-Americans being lynched, right? There are, there are books that, that are dedicated to the photography of lynching. That is because the lynching of African-Americans had such a festival sort of quality to it, right? And there was a really grotesque level of sexual violence and maiming and brutality involved in those where people are taking fingers, taking ears, taking testicles, saving those, taking photographs, turning them into postcards and sharing them around to friends and family. That is the entire larger culture of anti-Black lynching that is occurring. Black scholars, Black journalists did an incredible amount of work to collect up those postcards and other material and to preserve them, to archive them, to be able to tell the story and help hold the government accountable. So there's a, a history as to why we have those photographs of anti-Black lynching. I would suspect that anti-Mexican lynching did not have the same sort of public spectacle quality to it, which is why we don't have so many photographs. We do have some, and one of them is in, in this book. We do have some. That doesn't mean it's um, any less important, but it just there was a different culture that developed around the anti-Mexican um, lynching that was largest in Texas. But you want to learn more about this, I recommend looking at a website called Refusing to Forget, which documents um, a, these, these anti-Mexican lynchings across the United States, but largely in Texas. So refusingtoforget.org is a really important website, and they've also had a museum exhibition going across the country to help tell the story and to make it better known. Um, so you have imperialism, the beginnings of US imperialism. You have the beginnings of Mexican immigration to the United States, which is core to the US immigration story. And you have another story about race and inequity in the United States that people don't spend a lot of time talking about, right? Those are three of the stories that we can get into the heart of through the Magonistas, and all of them make clear that you cannot understand U.S. history without Mexico, without Mexicans, and without Mexican-Americans. And the Magonistas help us to ground that with Mexican and Mexican-American protagonists at the center of the American story, that the Magonistas forced Teddy Roosevelt, the Rockefellers, the Guggenheims, and many others to respond to the demands and the dreams of Mexico's dispossessed. These are historical players. They are actors. They changed the history of Mexico and the United States through their actions. So what this whole book is really about is using the Magonistas in some ways to open up the doors of US history, to understand the centrality of Latinx protagonists in the American story. And I bundle it up in a really fun and riveting tale that reads more like a spy novel, right? And you don't realize you're getting all this really core US history from a Mexican and Mexican-American um, perspective or positionality. So that is an overview of the book and why I think it, it really, really matters um, that all of us read this book. Right, that you take the book and you hand it to somebody, you know, we hand it to everybody. Um, and I'll take you a little bit deeper into the book and then we can have a conversation. That sound good? All right. So um, I'll tell you first about some of the main characters in this book, some of those main protagonists. Um, Labrado Rivera was one of the writers in Mexico City who comes north to the United States to restart Renaracion. He had been a, a teacher in San Luis Potosí, probably a math teacher, maybe geography, we're not quite sure. He might have taught a lot of different subjects, but he was a very quiet man. He was kind of ascetic in his ways. 
Uh, but he also thought that anybody could change history, could turn the page of history with enough metal and the right idea. His friends like to call him El Fakir, right? Because he was so quiet and so determined. There's this extraordinary woman who I want everyone in this country to know her name, which is Juana Belen Gutierrez de Mendoza. Let's do it together. Juana Belen Gutierrez de Mendoza. She's an extraordinary queer autodidact from the mountains of Durango who cuts her teeth as an organizer, as a dissident, by um, defending minors. Um, her husband had been a minor. She's arrested so many times in Mexico um, that she stops writing her name on her jail sheets. And when you're supposed to write her name, she just writes sedition and rebellion. Come on now. Juana is bad ass, right? Juana goes on to have um, a falling out with some of the main characters in this book. But she actually goes on to join Emiliano Zapata's army and helps to ghostwrite his plan de Ayala. And after the revolution goes on to fight for women's rights across Mexico. She's extraordinary. Um, there is Antonio Villarreal, who was a literature professor in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And he was imprisoned in Mexico for a little bit of time because he, he won a duel and he killed a man in Mexico. And some people say that duel was over a literary dispute. But he comes to the United States to join the Magonistas and to help them write for Regeneración. That's just a few of the people at the center of the story. There's incredible um, human beings, right? Brave human beings, brilliant human beings. But the person who's at the center of it all is this guy named Ricardo Flores Magón. And Ricardo's from Oaxaca. He grows up in Mexico City and becomes a journalist working with his older brother, Jesus Flores Magón. And they start this newspaper together, Renacion. Now, Ricardo, oh, Jesus is a lawyer and he is a um, very practiced and experienced dissident by the early 20th century. He had been in the student movement but he's a bit more conservative of a personality than his younger brother, brother Ricardo Flores Magón. Ricardo is brilliant. He's bold in the way that he will say and he will write the things that nobody else will. In Porfirio Diaz's Mexico, you could criticize things, but you could crit criticize that judge over there or that mayor over there or some local official. No one ever turned their pen against Porfirio Diaz himself. Once you did that, you were in trouble, right? Ricardo went straight for the heart of Porfirio Diaz. He said, the corruption is right at the heart of this country. And he would write against him. He said, he's a dictator, he's a tyrant, he's a brute. He's making Mexicans the, quote, servants of foreigners. And Porfirio Diaz was having none of this, right? So that's when he comes in, he has Ricardo and all of his friends arrested multiple times, literally smashes their printing presses in Mexico City and issues that, that gag order. So in January of 1904, Ricardo, Librado, Antonio, Juana, and many others very quietly leave Mexico and show up in Laredo, Texas. Within a couple of days of being in Laredo, Texas, they notice that they're being followed. And they know that that's Porfirio Diaz's spies. The local Mexican council there had alerted the government in Mexico and said, send the secret police. And that's a quote, send the secret police. So they were being followed everywhere throughout um, Laredo. So they flee Laredo, they go to San Antonio. Um, somebody breaks into their office in San Antonio and tries to stab Ricardo Flores Magón in the back. They flee very quietly from San Antonio and they go to St. Louis where they are able to um, not just restart Renacion, but also start this, this new party, El Partido Liberal Mexicano, the Mexican Liberal Party. Um, in July, in, in 1906, the Mexican Liberal Party declares that they're going to launch an all-out revolution against Porfirio Diaz within one year. So they say, you've got one year to shut us down. If you don't shut us down, it's on and popping in Mexico. And that's the point when the U.S. and Mexican governments get together and they stitch together this cross-border counterinsurgency team. How do they do it? Um, most important, the Mexican government hires a private detective named Thomas Furlong, who's based out of St. Louis. Furlong has spies across the country. Those spies are able to infiltrate the United States postal system. 
and when Ricardo Flores Magon and his buddies all go on the run and begin to live as fugitives, they're living in Texas, they're in California, they're in Canada, they're constantly on the move, right, while they're trying to put together this revolution. Those spies in the U.S. Postal Service who are being given access to the, to the rebels' mail are opening up their letters, taking out the letters, writing down their letters to one another, and then putting them back in the envelope and sending them on the way, hoping that the Magonistas don't figure out that they're being followed. This is surveillance. Imagine someone following your Twitter feed, following the pings on your telephone. All This is high-level surveillance for this time period. They're hoping that the Magonistas don't figure out that they're getting followed because then they can chase those addresses and they can figure out what's happening, where the next raid is going to happen, right? But the Magonistas do figure out that they're being followed. They notice that their letters are showing up violada or violated wherever they show up or where they, wherever they arrive. And so they start to write in secret code and they start to use pseudonyms and they start to send their letters to at least five or six intermediaries before they get to their final destination. And this way, they're often able to stay just one step, two steps ahead of this cross-border counterinsurgency team. And in this book, I have an example, if you're a teacher, um, of one of their letters that's written in secret code, and then I have the code. And you can have your students break the code of the letter and find out what the rebels are saying to one another. So in this way, the um, cross-border counterinsurgency team is able to track them, arrest many of the Magonistas across the United States, and they're able to find Ricardo Flores Magon, who's living in a hideout here in Los Angeles on Pico Boulevard at the edge of downtown in August of 1907. Thomas Furlong and his spies, along with two Mexican-American detectives of the LAPD, crash into this hideout at the edge of downtown. And there's a brawl between Ricardo Flores Magon, Labrado Rivera, Antonio Villarreal, and these detectives and these police officers. It's like an hour, they're smashing furniture, they're breaking dishes over each other, they're pounding one another, their fight falls out into the street. They're living in a largely Mexican-American neighborhood. People begin to notice, like, yo, is that is that Ricardo Flores Magón? Like, what's going on? Because he's legendary in Mexico and among immigrants by this time. They begin to chant, like, let him go, let him go. But Furlong and the others knock him unconscious. They throw him in a car, in a wagon. and. The idea is that they probably were trying to kidnap them, to get them down into Mexico and perhaps assassinate them or imprison them there. But the Mexicanos on the streets of Los Angeles interrupted that kidnapping. So they drag Ricardo and Librado and Antonio through the streets of Los Angeles and they throw them in the LA city jail and later the county jail. Um, Ricardo ends up doing three years, a dramatic story in and of itself, um, here in Los Angeles and Arizona. He's not released from prison until the summer of 1910, as the revolution is about to begin. And the Mexican government literally had all these parties here in Los Angeles on yachts and downtown um, hotels, celebrating the capture of Ricardo Flores Magón, known as El Ama de Todo, right? Basically the soul of the revolution. Their hope was if they could put him in jail, the revolution would be snuffed out with him, right? That didn't happen. Because Ricardo Flores Magón, Magón was important, but he wasn't everything. Most important, the women of the revolution stepped up, stepped in, and held it all together. So as Ricardo was being held in solitary confinement in the L.A. County Jail, his life partner, a woman named Maria Brousset, stern-faced, often wearing all black, a socialist turned anarchist, who lived in Los Angeles, who left her husband and was raising her child as her own, and who had taken Ricardo Flores Magón in when he was on the run, and they start a relationship. She shows up at the county jail and says, well, you know, <clears throat> that's, that's my boyfriend in there, right? And I need to come and do his laundry. So I'm just here to drop off some clean underwear for him and to pick up his dirty stuff, and I'll take it and I'll do his laundry. Now, come on, that's not what Maria was up to, right? <laughs> Maria has sewn little notes into his clean underwear and to the seams of his clean pants. There was rebel correspondence, right? Between the Magonistas and Ricardo Flores and Magon and love letters between the two of them. She would drop off the clean clothes that had the hidden rebel correspondence within them. And she'd pick up the dirties and he had done the same. He had picked out those notes written on these tiny little pieces of paper, sewn them up and sewn them into the seams of his dirty clothes and she'd come pick it up. In that way, Ricardo stayed completely involved in the movement. 
So we often think about people who are imprisoned as being separate from our world, right? But the imprisoned have always been at the heart of our revolutions. And this is just another example of an imprisoned individual, a political prisoner, staying at the heart of the revolution. Maria made that possible. She also sm smuggled out the battle plans for a set of raids in 1908 that um, between June 25th and June 30th of 1908, the PLM launched three raids on Mexico from Texas. Maria is the one who smuggled out those battle plans and handed them off to a very important magonista named Praxidis Guerrero. Now, Praxidis Guerrero was born into wealth in Mexico. He grew up on a ha hacienda. He had private tutors. He you know, did equestrian competitions, wrote poetry. But when he was a teenager, he renounced all that wealth. And he decided, I'm going to go to, to the United States and live like the majority of Mexicanos in the United States. I'm going to be a, a wage laborer and a migrant worker. He is traveling across the United States from Colorado to California. He settles in Southern Arizona, becomes a miner, and this is where he meets up with the Maguanistas and joins the PLM. They had a, a foco or a cell in Southern Arizona. And when Ricardo is arrested in Los Angeles, he comes to Los Angeles to help build the revolution. Now, what's so important about Praxidis Guerrero is that one, he can write. He's got that power of the pen, just like Ricardo Flores Magón. But whereas Ricardo would write these diatribes, I mean, I, it's hard to translate them. It's hard to give you a snippet of them because they go on for like an entire page and he's just going off on Porfirio Diaz, right? Praxidus really perfected the short snippet, right? That people could learn and then through oral culture and tradition speak across the borderlands. So he says things or he writes things like, if you cannot walk to freedom, then run. Mm. So a seed of rebellion and reap a harvest of, um, so a seed of rebelliousness, rebelliousness and reap a harvest of rebellion. And most important, he wrote, it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. Y'all know that one, right? Mm -hmm. Praxidus Guerrero brought that phrase, that anarchist phrase to the revolution. Emiliano Zapata by this time is reading Renacion. He's picking it up and he's figuring out, you know, he's picking up some of these phrases. That's from Praxidus Guerrero. So Praxidus takes these smuggled out battle plans from Maria in Los Angeles and goes to Texas and helps to launch these three raids on Mexico in June of 1908. These raids are incredibly lethal. Dozens of people are, ki are killed on both sides. Um, they really strike fear in the heart of the United States that Jimenez in 1906 had been a small raid. These ones are pretty massive and they think that this revolution is, is afoot. And so what happens in the United States is the United States Department of Justice and Teddy Roosevelt, who's president at this time, had just established a new police force. Largely for Teddy Roosevelt, he wanted to be able to enforce land law in the American West, where all these big companies were buying up all the land and, and doing all their shenanigans. But on July 1st of 1908, the US Department of Justice establishes this police force called the Bureau of Investigation, which goes on to become the FBI. Very quickly, they pivot this new Bureau of Investigation and they assign about a third of the very first Bureau agents to hunting down the Magonistas. The FBI cut its teeth on trying to shut down the outbreak of the 1910 revolution by hunting down the Magonistas, namely Praxidis Guerrero and all the others who were still free, gun running, and speaking and writing across the borderlands. But the FBI was too late. Praxidis Guerrero, Ricardo Flores Magón, Labrador Rivera, Antonio Villarreal, Juana Belen, Gutierrez de Mendoza, and the others had already created the conditions for the outbreak of the 1910 revolution. And so that is the, the story at the heart of this book, that by studying the Magonistas, by learning their extraordinary tale, we can learn about really the birth of U.S. imperialism in Mexico. We can learn about U.S. immigration history and the centrality of Mexico and Mexicans in that story. We learn about the racial violence and inequity the Mexican immigrants 
faced when they arrived here in the United States. And in fact, this book about the coming of revolution in Mexico begins with a lynching in Texas. And I'll actually read that um, beginning of the book and then we can have a conversation. Sound good? Okay. Um, this is hard. I'll tell you that now. They lit the pyre and they watched him burn. Antonio Rodriguez, is a 20 year old ranch hand, murdered a white woman, they said. White men from nearby farms formed a posse to track him down, while the other residents in Rock Springs, Texas, some 400 of them, met at the edge of town and piled kindling at the base of a mesquite tree. The posse soon arrived with a cowboy in the lead, dragging Rodriguez by a lasso looped around his neck. The mob laughed as they chained Antonio to the tree and doused him in kerosene. Someone threw a match, and 30 minutes later, when Antonio Rodriguez was dead, the residents of Rock Springs, Texas, quote, returned quietly to town, and business was resumed. It was November 3rd, 1910. Mexican-American journalists in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands reported the grisly details of Rodriguez's murder, condemning it as an act of racial terror akin to the lynching of African-Americans in the South. Newspapers in Mexico picked up the story. Quote, lynching is not practiced by the blonde Yankee except upon beings whom, for ethnic reasons, he considers his inferiors, fumed the editors of the Mexico City paper, El Debate. Another paper dubbed Anglo-Americans the, quote, barbarous whites of the North, deriding them as giants of the dollar, but pygmies of culture. There is indignation among Mexicans here over this lynching, reported El País. By November 8, 1910, riots had erupted across Mexico. Targeting the considerable number of U.S.-owned businesses and homes, the protesters smashed windows and tore down American flags while chanting, Mueren los Yankees, death to the Americans. The police arrested hundreds of people. In one case, officers drew sabers and descended upon a crowd, killing one man by stabbing him through the neck. The protests continued on the streets in the press, prompting Henry Lane Wilson, the U.S. ambassador to Mexico, to issue a public warning. The United States government will, quote, leave nothing undone to protect U.S. citizens and property in Mexico. It was a threat. The United States would invade Mexico if attacks on U.S. interests did not cease. The protests raged on. Ambassador Wilson decided to visit General Porfirio Diaz, the dictator of Mexico, to insist that he put a stop to the, quote, anti-American disturbances. But it was too late. By November of 1910, Ricardo Flores Magón and the Magonistas had ceded the bed of revolution in Mexico, and the revolution began later that month. So thank you. That's the overview of the book, and I would love to have a conversation about um, about the Magonistas and U.S. history and the centrality of Mexico, Mexican Americans, Mex uh, in that story. I'm happy to just field questions if you want to throw up a hand or yes, I see you are ready from the go. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to this. I'm so excited. I have not met this book for this time, but I will be getting one today. I have to be able to sign it. But I think what you've described so far in a really engaging and fascinating way is the fact that it kind of creates a backdrop for, you know, people like John and Donald who are in the entertainment industry who are making commentary on the fact that, you know, with the recent Thor movie that just came out, the Latinx population was, I think, second in terms of like the highest yeah. percentage of consumers of that product. However, the writers, the producers, mm -hmm. the you know, the other team behind these, you know, mega black star film productions, it's not representative of that. So I am so uh, thank you, thank you. That is really interesting. And in terms of what you were describing too, in terms of the invisibility That's right. that exists, I think it's really interesting how it was very strategic and how it's still perpetuated like within entertainment and other industries as well, but since that's the most visible of like consumers. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, again, the, the, the political motive, well, there's many political motivations of writing this book for me. One of them is to address that invisibility, right? And if we can't, I feel like the, the Magonistas have another revolution in them. And that revolution is to break open these doors. This tale is, even when I'm writing it, I would constantly have to go back to all my references and go, wait, did that really happen? Did they really do that? It's such an extraordinary story. Um, that if we can't break down those doors with the Magonistas, I, I do increasingly worry what's possible, right? It is such a, a tale that's made for um, broad consumption. So I, I do hope that, but again, it's like a smuggling operation. All you all are part of the smuggling operation, right? Like we give them a bunch of candy to smuggle in, you'll walk away from reading this book going like, wow, I really know a lot about Mexican American history now. Not everything, right? But it's a it's a, a beginner book, a gateway book, right? To get into more. Yes. So what you described, um, uh, I just remember, you know, a phrase that sometimes um, I say when people talk about immigration and it's, you know, people coming here, it's like, well, we're here because we were there first, right? Talking about That's right. Um, American, uh, American, but anyway, what I would like to know is what has been the reception of uh, the book among people, you know, American people, or white people specifically, not only about, you know, around Mexican Americans or immigrants. So, have you, have you been able to? Um, well, I don't know the full response, of course. Um, it's been getting good reviews, and what you would understand is sort of the mainstream mm -hmm. press. Mm -hmm. um, typically, what I'm hearing from people, like journalists or people who are doing interviews, is I had no idea about this history. And they are, they, they're curious. They do want to know more, right? And that is part of the point of the book. Like, if, if you didn't know this, what else do you not know? So go out and get another book and another book and another book, right? And read deeper into Mexican-American history specifically, but Latinx history, indigenous history. I mean, there's a lot of stories that are not being told or centered, right? Um, so there hasn't been any pushback yet that I am aware of. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard the interview on Fresh Air. It was wonderful. Yeah. 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 Yes. Can I ask, um, what is it that attracted uh, Ricardo Torres Magón to Los Angeles in particular? What was going on here? Who? There must have been, possibly not been other organizations existent already that would be supportive of this ideology that's right that's right so begin in laredo they go to san antonio which is an incredibly important mexican-american hub right especially in texas but in the country at this point then they go to st louis we don't really know why they go to st louis that seems a little strange right and many there's not a big mexicano population but it is a pretty straight shot up the railroad from mexico city and pretty far from porfirio diaz right so we're thinking that it's because it's a railroad hub and it's almost as far as they could get from the border and his spies without getting off the railroad, um, a direct mm -hmm. line. He's arrested in St. Louis and then is bailed out probably by Francisco Madero and a couple of others. And he goes on the run, he skips bail. We're not quite sure all the places he went, but he went to Canada, to Texas, to San Francisco, right after the earthquake, he's in San Francisco. And then he comes down and he's in and out of Los Angeles a few times. Now, what draws him to Los Angeles? There is a very active um, socialist party here in Los Angeles with Joe Perryman and the others who are, who are rising in power. And there's a fairly substantial Mexican American, Mexican and Mexican American like chapter of the local socialist party here in, in Los Angeles. LA is also, a rapidly growing Mexican immigrant population. More and more Mexicanos are coming to Los Angeles. So it's almost like following the flow that was coming with the railroads and with the streetcars and all the construction that is happening in Los Angeles as well with the expansion of 
agricultural industry. There were so many Mexican immigrants. The population was growing so fast in LA that by 1930, right, there'd be more Mexicans in Los Angeles than any other city in the world other than Mexico City, right? So there's Mexico City and then there's LA. Not any other city in Mexico. That's the kind of growth that we're talking about that's happening in early years of the 20th century. So I suspect it's those reasons. There's political reasons. There's a um, bookstore in downtown Los Angeles that's owned by a Mexican immigrant that is very supportive of the Maguanistas. It's caring or has their own, um, provides a hideout to him and his brother when they're in town. I think that bookstore is like a, like a beacon in some ways for many Mexican rebels in the, in the region. So all the, those things are coming together. Um, when they're in San Francisco, they have no friends. There's no one they're connected to. They're staying at like a hostel and they're trying to get any food that they can. They can't find a job. Um, same thing in Canada, but in LA, they seem to be completely um, becoming a part of a social network that was already in place. You know, the extraordinary um, Teresita, is in Los Angeles by then. Um, Teresa Urrea, who was this um, curandera from Mexico who Diaz had called the most dangerous girl in Mexico for inspiring so many really indigenous folks in Northern Mexico to rebel against the Diaz regime. He kicks her out of Mexico in the late 19th century. She is traveling around um, and winds up in Los Angeles. She's in Los Angeles by, this, by the early 20th century. There's so many people coming here. If you want to learn about, more about Teresita, another amazing um, historical figure, um, Luis Urrea has several really great historical novels on on her, um, and I would recommend checking those out. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have a question online by Lori Garcia, uh, who asks, "How can this important part of U.S. history be introduced into school curriculum? Is it even possible?" Yeah, so I, maybe Lori's a teacher. So, and um, there's lots of great ways that this very particular story could be introduced into the K through 12 curriculum. So first, when people are talking about in the curriculum westward expansion, that creep into Mexico is a part of the westward expansion story. And so you can talk about the rise of US imperialism um, when you talk about Manifest Destiny, when you talk about the Transcontinental Railroad, those are both two really good places to hook in um, this story. Um, you can talk about this story when you talk about the Red Scare. Ricardo Flores Magón ends up being imprisoned um, at the last moment. It's part of the Red Scare, really. And people talk about Emma Goldman. They talk about Eugene Debs. No one ever talks about Ricardo Flores Magón, who was also arrested and imprisoned and sent to Leavenworth during the same Red Scare. Um, you can hook into the story at that moment as well. And I would say that if you are talking about um, issues of race in early 20th century and the growth of Jim Crow, you can certainly talk about the growth of Juan Crow in the Southwestern United States um, and talk about the distinctions, but this is all a part of the story of white supremacy in 20th century America. And it doesn't look exactly the same in every place. Of course it doesn't, right? But that's important to talk about the distinctions and the differences, but it all has bearing. For, for people of color in what is essentially a white settler society. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Victor, by the way, and thank you for the great presentation that we uh, are making tonight. Sure, it's a lot of fun for me, I like history, I love history. Oh, good. So, um, so, I grew up in Mexico, I came here when I was 17, I went to the, you know, it was 11th in Japan, it was a time, um, educational system. And I only know about the Cabo Flores Magón because of, um, you know, elementary school names and street names. Okay. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, Francisco Madero is the one that's given most of the credit for the, you know, uh, the revolution, right, in 1910. And, um, so I also learned um, that he went to college at Cal. He did, Francisco so, uh, Madero. Yeah. Uh, Madero. Yeah. Madero, right, exactly. And that's my alma mater, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I can remember that. So uh, I wonder what uh, role did he play within the, the group? 
Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what role did Francisco Madero play in the Magonistas? Was father, right? Oh yeah. No. I, well, he's in college earlier. He comes back. To, he goes back to Mexico um, and helps re you know build up his family business. And then by the early twentieth century, he's getting into politics. Is that right? um, he's from La Laguna era area. Yeah. 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 So he. Okay. So this is the big part of the, the book, right, in, in some ways, is not just the relationship with Francisco Madero, but the, the politics of the Magonistas. So Ricardo Flores Magón goes from being a pretty militant liberal, right, to an anarchist during the course of the story between 1904 and 1910. Several people, Labrador Rivera, his younger brother, Enrique Flores Magón, others also become anarchist by 1910-1911. Another group of the Magonistas maybe are friendly with anarchism, but are also down with socialism. Some are hardcore socialist. Um, but what holds the Magonistas together is they all agree that an armed revolution, they agree very early on, an armed revolution is needed to depose Diaz. That he's never going to step down. Diaz always says before the next presidential election, oh, I, you know, I'm not going to run. You know, it's no big deal. <laughs> And then he gets completely drafted into running by these patriotic associations. He goes, okay, if you really want me to run, I'll run again, right? Mm -hmm. That's the game. And he would usually win like, yes, something like 99% of the vote, right? And it was all kinds of shenanigans that went on to make that happen. So all the Magonistas, despite their political differences, agree very early on, armed revolt is the only way to create change in Mexico. Francisco Madero is like early on, like, no, nah, we can use the political process, right? I'm going to run against, run some governors. We're going to run people against his regime. Shut down, shut down, shut down, right? Francisco Madero himself runs against Porfirio Diaz for the presidency in 1910, loses phenomenally, gets arrested on the eve of the revolution, right? You know this story very well. And it's that um, where at that moment, very late, Francisco Madero says, okay, we need an armed revolution. And that's when Surrey comes all together. But he had had differences with Ricardo Flores Magón on this issue earlier on. So when the Magonistas were just talking about, he helped them relaunch their newspaper. He sent them a loan when they came to the United States. It's his money that helps them relaunch for Generacion. He's a very wealthy man. Do you know where he gets the money from? It's from his family. His family built that money during the US Civil War smuggling cotton for the southerners through mexico because the union shut down the ports there's other things too but that's a big part of where they get their money from um so he's supporting the magonistas he writes some notes saying yeah the things you're saying are really important we want you to keep writing what they start saying well, we're not going to just write we're going to fight madero pulls back so there's a long relationship between madero ricardo flores magon the maderistas and the magonistas that you know really hits a crescendo at the beginning of the revolution. But you're right. Francisco Madero, in the end, is the one who has the money to fund an army, right? To depose Diaz. The Magonistas, they they're literally mailing guns to one another and mailing bullets, like handfuls of bullets to one another. They are poor. They do not have the resources to take on Porfirio Diaz. Madero does. He is smuggling guns and rifles and dynamite and bullets into Mexico for that revolution. And he also, he goes to Mexico and he leads at least a couple really important battles that Pancho Villa and others are like, yo, you're the, you're the dude, right? And so he's able to stitch it together in the north, Emilio Zapata is in the, you know, more in the south, and they're able to squeeze them. Juana is in Mexico City, throwing together all these urban plots with others. I mean, she stays a part of the story the whole time. Ricardo Flores Magón never returns to Mexico. Even when the Magonistas, they raid four times, they occupy Baja California in 1911, he never returns to Mexico. It is hard to lead a revolution when you don't return to lead the troops, right? Or at least participate in that. So it's, I would argue a big reason why Ricardo Flores Magón skids out and Francisco Madero rises. One is his politics of anarchy, 
a lot of people are like, yo, we're really not down with all of that. But also his refusal to return to Mexico. And Ricardo's a bitter man. The guy who's bold enough to go against Porfirio Diaz before anybody else does, right? And he has that, his tongue is like a weapon. His pen is a weapon, right? He turns that against his friends, his comrades, anyone who does not follow him on the path of anarchy. He turns against Juana. He turns against Antonio Villarreal. He turns against many people. So there's one historian who says that Ricardo had the greater mind, but Francisco Madero was the greater man. And that's also, I think, a part of what's happening. Madero was able to stitch together a coalition of different personalities, different people and whatnot. Ricardo was like, it's this way, my way, or the highway. And he couldn't stitch together a political coalition. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on. A lot of that's in the book. Um, that's a really important question. What happened to the Magonistas, basically? Yes? Well, first off, thank you uh, for the discussion. I've been eager to learn about, like, Flores Magon and the Chile movement, like, once they're good from a professor in San Diego, San Diego. Um, so thank you. But uh, my question is, can you, like, talk about what makes the PLM movement different from other popular movements at the time, or even now? Or even now, that's a really good question. Um, well, one of the things that's really interesting about the PLM is their first manifesto, which they issue in July of 1906. And the thing that's so interesting about it to me is that it's not just written by the leaders of La Junta, right? They literally crowdsource this manifesto. They have people write in from across Mexico and across the United States what they want to see change in Mexico, and they include it all. That's a pretty democratic way of thinking about a manifesto, and I think that's fairly unique to them, at least in this time period. There are things in that manifesto I don't think Ricardo Flores Magón agreed with, namely the anti-Chinese piece of that platform, where they wanted to end Chinese immigration to Mexico, seeing Chinese immigrants as a racial threat, and also a labor threat. I mean, there's a strong anti-Chinese movement in Mexico at this time, uh, which results in at least one, more than one massacre, one in 1911, which is quite significant. Over 300 people are murdered in Torreon. So I think that's one of the things that's really interesting about, about the Magonistas at that time. A lot of the other movements are more sort of leader heavy, right? So even when Ricardo's put in jail, he's taken out, this movement keeps moving, right? So it's a strong base to it. A lot of women. An incredible historian, Sonia Hernandez, has a new book out. Um, I'll have to get the, the title for you. But one of the things she found was all of these PLM focos or cells across the borderlands that were all female. I didn't know about that. I've never seen that. Sonia Hernandez found that. These all-female focos across the borderlands. Extraordinary. So again, I'm not sure how many of those there were at the time. Um, I think of the PLM in some ways today as being like BLM, right? What the PLM is able to do is they don't take the presidency. You know, by 1911, Ricardo doesn't want it. He's like, I'm an anarchist. I don't want a position in government. I want to abolish government, right? But what the PLM does is they are able to change the terms of the debate and the conversation in Mexico. Whereas Francisco Madero and others were talking about political change. All we need to do is get rid of Diaz. Nothing else needs to change. We need to restore democracy. Ricardo Flores Magón and the Magonistas were talking about an economic revolution. Right? Whether it be socialism or anarchy, whatever, they were talking about labor power in ways that nobody else really was. And they changed the terms of the conversation. Many of the pieces of that 1906 manifesto do get included in the 1917 constitution that comes in Mexico after the revolution. The Magonistas put those terms into the conversation. BLM has done much the same thing, right? They have changed the terms of the conversation about race and state violence in this country in a way that nobody else was talking. No one was talking about abolition, popular 
in popular culture, right? Whether you agree with it or not, they pushed that and made that part of the conversation. And so I think that they're operating in very similar ways that without them, the radical possibilities would be much more constrained and that they are changing the terms of the debate. And these countries have never been the same because of their movements. I think maybe we have time for one more. Well, we have a question on, uh, by Liz Gonzalez. Um, she's asking, did the Magnitas ever banish clergy or nuns from the areas where they had a gun? So the question is, did the Magonistas ever banish the clergy, right? Because they wanted to, well, many of them wanted to abolish government, private property, and the church, right? What they called the, the evil trinity. Um, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that. They only occupy Baja California, um, and that's pretty much a debacle that happens in 1911. You can read about it in the book. Um, so I'm not aware of that happening. Okay, was there a short question or? Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know if it's meant to be forward, but I said. So I, I have seen Mexico change a lot in sure. you know, my family now. Now I look like there's democracy. And I think uh, I think now Mexico, along with Canada, are strongest allows of the United States, at least economically. Mm -hmm. And I think. That will lead to political uh, integration as well. So open borders eventually. Um, that's not going to be perfect. <laughs> so maybe we'll, But how do you see that affecting the rest of the Mexicans or Mexican Americans that live in Mexico? I think the world is changing. Political integration. Political, economic. Um, you know, I think uh, eventually uh, Canada, the United States, and Mexico will have a stronger military alliance that it needs. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm a historian. I, I don't know if I can predict the future in that sort of way. I mean, there's certainly we could talk about that the NAFTA group. There's also this really broad um, geography of U.S. empire, right? So whether it be Puerto Rico or Samoa, there are many places that I think that we could be talking about what does this political formation look like 50 or 100 years from now um, if those borders were to be abolished in some kind of way. I, I, I make no predictions about all that. It's a good question, but we'd have to go have a drink and just sort of BS about that. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's it. Thank you so much, everybody, for your great questions. And I think I'm signing books if folks want to do that. Yeah? Okay.